So uh, what we're going to do in the first session today is to talk about uh, the labour market model uh, which Umberto referred to in his talk yesterday and, uh, and, and more generally about how we teach the aggregate economy. I've pasted uh, two, two, just the, the opening uh, shots of two units here and the, re the real reason I've done this is to draw your attention to the green one because that was just released yesterday. Uh, the titles of these are the same. There, there is overlap in the material, but the, the green one is different in two ways. One, it's more recent, so more crowdsourced feedback, and, and uh, uh, we hope it's, it explains some things uh, better than what we were able to achieve in the red one. And, um, it's, it, so, and it's for a different audience. So, again, we want you to to make use of it. Those of you who are very familiar with this one, have a quick glance at that one and see whether you like some things, and that will also help us to improve uh, the economy as well. I showed you this slide yesterday, which was to highlight uh, the, the, the way we, in core we work through the material and then uh, to make the claim that this places us in a very good position to teach macroeconomics in, if you like, in a way that's close to the way macroeconomics is done, where we've got heterogeneous <coughs> agents, we've got these different actors, firms, employees, lenders, borrowers, uh, banks, central bank, government, all making purposeful decisions. So it really rests on the, the, what I referred to yesterday as the core of the core established in the, uh, the initial units um, in the economy. What defines cause treatment of macroeconomics? It's distinctive in the way it treats growth. So growth is taught as arising from endogenous technological progress right from the outset. That's in, in a way something that uh, students encounter in the very first unit and it's, it's taken further in the second one. Uh, it connects productivity growth with investment decisions taken in response to the opportunities uh, to, to make rents, to take advantage of, of, uh, of rents in, in the economy. They could be arising because of changes in relative prices. They could be arising for uh, reasons of a new innovation. So this is the way we think about growth. And the, the, the uh, final bullet point is to highlight the fact that we're always thinking about who the actors are in the model, who the actors are and what decisions they're making. So the actors making savings and business investment decisions are not the same people. So it's households making savings decisions, essentially, and uh, b uh, firms making business investment decisions. So what that suggests is that we omit teaching using the solo model, where savings are automatically invested, and where there's exogenous technological progress. So there's quite a sharp, uh, you can see a sharp set of decisions that have been taken to, uh, to organize the way we handle growth. I'm not going to speak more about growth, but that was just to, uh, to clarify that. The sec a second uh, defining characteristic is the way we teach about money, banks, <coughs> and financial instability, particularly in units 10, 11, and 17. I'm using here the numbers from, from the red one, from the economy. Uh, money is endogenous. There's no banking multiplier. This is gradually making its way uh, into the textbooks. They're finally getting rid of the, the very old way of thinking about the relationship between banks and money. Banks, in our treatment, create money by making loans. The central bank sets the interest rate. And financial instability can arise from debt-driven housing bubbles. So that's a very uh, shortened version of uh, how we handle these issues in core. The third uh, dimension that I'm going to spend a little bit more time on is uh, the labour market, business cycles, inflation and macro policy. So this really starts from the labour market model uh, in Unit 6, which is continued in Unit 9. It's also, I should have included Unit 10 there, 13 to 15 and 17. And what we've tried to, to construct in the way we build the model of the aggregate economy is to create uh, a unified model 
of forward-looking actors in a world of limited information and in incomplete contracts. So instead of teaching uh, something to do with unemployment and then something else to do with fiscal policy and another thing to do with monetary policy, something to do with inflation, we build these elements up from, uh, in all cases, uh, the micro foundations, the decisions that are being taken by different actors. This has an advantage of giving us direct links to inequality, to we can, we can, I'll show you just a, an example of that, where we can uh, connect the central model, the diagram of the labour market with uh, the Lorenz curve and the Gini coefficient. We have a model of inflation stabilising unemployment uh, represented or presented as the national equilibrium of the labour market where all actors are doing the best they can given what everyone else is doing. So there's not full, a full employment notion. This is, so one model of this uh, is obviously Shapiro Stiglitz, Stiglitz even earlier, and that produces the wage setting and price setting curves. We have a model of cyclical unemployment where we have aggregate demand-based fluctuations around the structural unemployment which is uh, determined by the wage and price setting curves. And this is Blanchard Kiyotaki, Dixit Stiglitz, if you're trying to think of the hooks to attach these parts of the model to in the, uh, in the literature. We have a bargaining gap based Phillips curve so that the Phillips curves are derived directly from the wage and price setting curves. So that a movement along a Phillips curve is due to aggregate demand fluctuations and shifts of Phillips curves are due either to expectations or to <coughs> supply side shocks of one kind or another. So that's a kind of package and, and it's uh, the challenge that we face with, with our students is, is bringing them along and motivating them to put together these aspects of the package. Once they have that package then they're really in a great position to analyse a whole variety of different kinds of shocks and policy responses that they may be interested in. The macroeconomic policy dimension is, uh, if you like, the Clara de Gali gertler uh, three-equation model is kind of uh, one way of thinking about this, of a goal-oriented central bank, or you can think about it in terms of a, a central bank that uses a Taylor rule, but we have a model of why you get a Taylor rule, if you like, rather than just saying there is one. Uh, it's not just uh, a reaction. It's a reaction of an actor that uh, has objectives and faces constraints. We teach this as the first model. We do not teach ISLM. We do not teach ADAS. And this is where some friction arises with A-level students or students who've done economics at high school who become terribly attached to... Their, uh, their framework and we simply sweep it, sweep it away. Just as a note, uh, this has now been adopted in Blanchard's latest version of Intermediate Macro and I think is gradually making its way through as the textbook writers uh, update their work. I've emphasised already that we tie the macro model explicitly to micro foundations. Wage setting, price setting, uh, so Unit 6 and Unit 7, just following one after the other. Uh, credit constraints and consumption smoothing in Unit 10. We introduce coordination game-based investment behaviour uh, uh, rooted in the kind of models that they've, uh, they've encountered very early in the course in Unit 4. So it's a very nice way of going back and using a tool that they've got in their toolkit for a, for a different purpose. So the payoff is that we are able to illuminate 100 years of economic history from the Great Depression to the global financial crisis. This happens in Unit 17, and some people might even want to start with Unit 17 as a kind of great motivator and then uh, say, well, look, how do, we, how do we get into a position where we can understand these very different kinds of crises that have, uh, that have uh, occurred in the world over a 100-year period? Well, we can put together a modelling framework that will uh, put you in a position to do this. And it integrates the analysis of inequality, as I, as I mentioned before. 
Uh, the, at the root of the modeling with, with these heterogeneous agents is uh, a set of principal agent problems, and I'm not going to go through this in detail. The slides will be available, so anyone who wants to use them or to you know, reflect on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of sequence that I've used, uh, as you, you may want to engage in discussions with colleagues in your department about why we do it this way, and uh, the slides could be a kind of uh, a refresher for that. So in the labour market, it's, this, uh, it's the principal agent problem between the employer and the employee. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, I think, in the comments. Thinking about this as the basis of the macroeconomic model, uh, I think from, from experience may be more difficult for the instructors than it turns out to be for the students. Uh, so let's, um, uh, in, in particular, it's, it's fairly easy to get discussions with students about what the conflict of interest is, between the employer and the, uh, and the employee is about, and indeed get them to come up with, uh, with an explanation of what is le left out of the contract, why there's a cost of, of losing your job, and why therefore there must be uh, involuntary unemployment in the economy, why you're not indifferent between having a job and not having a job, as is characteristic of this model of the labour market that they never see. Uh, this is the modelling framework. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through this, but this is the worker's best response fun function. This is the wage here and effort. These clickable diagrams, if you haven't yet experimented with the e-book, are all there. The clickable uh, PowerPoint slides are also there in the teacher's resources that you can build into your lectures if you're, after yesterday's discussion, still planning to give lectures. And as I said, this is a, an example of the, of the feasible set that we are using as a general structure. So that's the, the slope of the best response function is the MRT. We then introduce the, uh, uh, the firm's decision. The firm obviously wants to minimize the cost of effort, and we find the, the tangency between these, which are the indifference curves for the employer and the, uh, the worker's best response curve. Crucially, to get to the macro model, we have to show how these best response functions are related to key elements in, in the macro model that we're interested in. So particularly the level of unemployment and other aspects of, uh, for example, of supply side policy that are going to affect the reservation position of the worker and therefore going to shift the best response function. One uh, thing we do in core, and we are able to do it here, and students, I think, respond very well to this, is we take them very quickly to the research literature. So using the model that I've just set out, we can go to this paper by Lazia using this extremely interesting data from the financial crisis. So it's, it's data from a single firm, but a firm that has plants or offices, actually, they are, in different states where there's different uh, unemployment rates. So what they did was able, using this very granular data, to measure worker productivity. So they could see how the productivity of workers in the same company varied according to local variation in unemployment. And what they found was what it says here, that workers speed up when the economy slows down. And uh, we can directly set an exercise for students that says use the best response function to sketch the results found by Lazia, and you can go through each of these exercises. The students are there interacting, engaging with the empirical results in a study that they find quite intriguing. And they're putting to work their, the model very quickly. So we go from conflicts within the firm to economy-wide unemployment and inequality. This is the, uh, the derivation of the wage setting curve, just going directly from the best response function, varying the rate of unemployment, as I uh, indicated on the previous slide. So I'm zooming through this, but I just want you to kind of get a feeling for the, the trajectory, and then um, we, can, we can go through some questions in more detail. So the wage setting curve is going to be one of the crucial pillars of the macro model. We go from the micro-modeling to the 
the, the part of the macro model that we're going to use repeatedly and then immediately to the data and show what a, a wage setting curve, curve looks, looks like using US data. This is in green because this is something that's in the, uh, in the economy, society and public policy that's not in the economy and that I think uh, you might want to put in if you're using the economy. Remember the students are always like to have a surprise, something they've not seen before. And this is a, an application of the model just showing them how they can use the kind of tools that they've assembled to think about this difference in unemployment between Spain and Germany. So they're thinking about two economies operating in the European Union, facing very similar conditions in terms of competition in product markets in principle. And then we can pick up three of the, of the elements that we can represent in the model. So we can look at the generosity of unemployment benefits, the openness of the economy to competition and labor productivity. And then we can translate in a, uh, in a schematic way those differences into, the, into the, the basic structure of the diagram and come up with, an, if you like, with uh, a, a hypothesis about how the factors that we can take account of in the model could account for the difference between Spain and Germany in terms of levels of real wages and unemployment. Okay, so what's shifting the price setting curve? Why is the price setting curve higher in Germany than in Spain? We're looking to the effect of competition and of productivity. And what's affecting the wage setting curve in Germany and in Spain? And we're looking to the role of the generosity of unemployment benefits. So that's the basis for many discussions. So it's a, it's a way of of bringing the model to the data that you might find useful. This is uh, the direct connection between a macroeconomic model and measuring un uh, inequality. And this is something that I don't think uh, people have, have even perhaps tried to do before. But we can literally translate from this model here, where we, we count the number of people in employment, we put the same number here, so obviously there are 10 owners in this economy. Okay, there are 90, uh, there are 90 members of the labor force. And then we can put the unemployed here, which is 10. And we're using the information about the split in productivity between profits and wages to give us the, the kink point on the Lorenz curve. And then again, you can manipulate the model Give it, look at various kinds of shocks and see what the implications are for inequality. Are they affecting inequality through unemployment? Are they affecting inequality through the split of the uh, of output per worker? The second principal agent problem is the one that really allows us to provide some kind of micro foundation for the, the role of aggregate demand fluctuations in the economy. And this is the relationship between the lender and the borrower and the, uh, the, how that produces credit constraints and credit excluded members of the population and therefore why uh, smoothing uh, is not always possible and we're going to get fluctuations in aggregate demand and we're going to have, a, if you like, a micro-founded basis for, uh, for the multiplier. So this is a much more satisfying, I think, way of introducing the role of the multiplier and of aggregate demand in creating fluctuations around the structural or equilibrium unemployment rate than is typically done. We bring the supply and demand sides together. This is a, a one, way, one, one way of uh, just highlighting this on a, on a slide, which is to ask the question, and it's a question many students maybe a few years ago, but some students in some countries are still asking, why is inflation falling? Uh, and we can, we can relate that to the model by asking, uh, what's happened to the bargaining gap? So what's happened to the gap between the wage setting and the price setting curve? And we can look at explanations that could come from, uh, uh, from stronger competition, and that's obviously a very topical issue. What's happened to competition in the product market over the, over the last decade or so? What's happened to uh, the, the, the position of workers in the labor market? So these are both supply side 
explanations that, that can account for why inflation is falling, or we can have the, uh, uh, the explanation coming from a demand-driven business cycle. So the circles show you that you're always looking for this gap between the wage setting and the price setting curve, because that's going to tell you what's happening to inflation when you've derived the Phillips curves from, from the model. So that's, that's just a, in, a, in, in summary. Again, uh, the intention being to create a unifying, a unified framework that allows a whole number of different uh, potential explanations for a phenomenon such as falling inflation. This is the, just showing more uh, detail on the case of uh, if there was an increase in the degree of competition. So suppose there was some success in reducing this trend that's ca at least characterized many economies over the last uh, couple of decades of increasing uh, power in the product market. If it was possible to, to turn that around, then we can ask the question, what would be the, the implications for inequality? And you can see that there are two channels through which this is working. One channel is working through its effect on unemployment, and the other channel is working through its effect on the markup and therefore the split of output per worker between profits and wages. So the, the Lorenz curve would shift in, and you can calculate, you can do, do the numbers and calculate the effect that that would have on the Gini coefficient. The central bank as an actor, I mentioned this yesterday. If you want to read more about uh, cause model of inflation, you can find this. Uh, this is one of the blog pieces that we have up there. And just to conclude, I was just going to give a kind of little insight into something that I thought of when I was giving my lectures this year. I thought of, okay, let's think of how we can review models, lots of different models that they've done over a whole course and apply them to something that students have started to ask questions about. And it's a good way to, uh, to kind of push yourself as well. So this was applying the models to the past and future of work. It was a good way of going right back and reviewing material from Unit 3, as well as uh, re reviewing material they'd done much more recently in the second term. It was a way also of bringing in a recent research article about robots and the comparison between the effect that robots were having in the US economy and the German economy. So this was the outline. Think about jobs and the gig economy. How can we use the apparatus that we've developed to answer questions, to model what's happening there? And a whole number of other uh, dimensions that, that were covered at one stage or another. We had the tools. We could then go back and answer uh, address these kinds of questions. So I'm not going to go through the lecture, you'll be pleased to know. This is uh, just a slide from, from, uh, from the lecture, part one. Jobs in the gig economy, so what is it? And how can we relate it to some things they've seen earlier? So we're, uh, we're relating it here to peace rates, which they were introduced to the concept of peace rates uh, very early in the course, and we're trying to get them to think okay, if that's, some, if that's a way of thinking about the gig economy, then how can we compare the model of the labor market that they've kind of dug into and really worked hard at during the term, and how, how can we use that to, to compare with how the gig economy works? So we can think about the nature of the contract. We can think about how payment is, is made. So there's a whole series of comparisons that we can make between... The, the standard labor market of the employer and the employee in a firm, and the gig economy where more or less complete contracts characterize the, uh, the, the workers' relationship with their work. Give the students an exercise. Get them to, so the blank uh, axes are always very effective. Um, get them to figure out themselves how they should adjust the best response function using the lo these two kinds of uh, contrasting logic about the gig economy. So how does it affect uh, employees in con conventional firms? There are two potential channels. So you might want to scribble down your, your response and see if you, if you can apply the model to this question. We can introduce the, uh, the robots using the Lorenz curve. This is a segmented labor market, and we can look at what happens 
uh, when the, the people who have skills substitutable by robots or skills complementary to robots and how that, is, how that shows up in a change in the Lorenz curve. And then using that research article, let's compare the effect of robots from the data, this very detailed, again, very granular data that's reported in the article, uh, the effect of robots in the U US and Germany. And we can take a model they've studied uh, in great detail in Unit 16 and figure out in the model how we represent what's happened as a consequence of robots in the US. And on the other hand, what's happened with the much more intensive introduction of robots in Germany. Okay, so that it's uh, again, I think, very motivating for the students to see that this model is actually helpful in, in, their, uh, in, in getting back to those questions that they're asking uh, in the word clouds that we saw yesterday. So I'm going to stop there. And David. Right, so there's one more thing. Okay, some people have been asking about <laughs> what happens after core in terms of macro. I, rather than out of my own mouth, I prefer to uh, you to read what Mark Gertler said. So that's where I will stop. <laughs> I'll just on the desktop quickly. Okay, well, good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks to Wendy and to the CORE project uh, for asking me to present here today. So I'll just start with a bit of background uh, to say that I've sort of always been very passionate about this project uh, and really what it's trying to achieve, uh, and part of that comes from in the not-too-distant past having studied uh, a more standard first-year uh, economics course uh, and considering it uh, far inferior to what uh, CORE is offering. So while doing my PhD, um, I worked, uh, as Sam was talking about yesterday, quite intensively on the first iteration of the ebook uh, and on the interactive figures uh, and the empirical evidence in particular. Um, since uh, then, I've moved on to King's College London, where I'm now a lecturer. Uh, and for the first time, I've had the kind of uh, the joy uh, and some of the stresses of teaching this material, of lecturing it uh, to a lot of people. Uh, so being on the both sides of the fence, if you like. Um, so I'm going to spend my time today talking a little bit about um, some of the approaches I've taken in lectures, some of the additional elements I brought in uh, when teaching the labour market uh, and the agroeconomy uh, using this material. Now, I think uh, some of these things I've brought in have been uh, a success, uh, both pedagogically and also in terms of kind of student participation, engagement in lectures, and also their satisfaction uh, with uh, this course. So just to talk you through the course that we offer at King's, which is using this core material, uh, we use the economy as the basis of our kind of flagship first-year economics module, uh, Principles of Economics. Uh, this is a compulsory course for a wide range of students uh, across three different degree programs, as you can see there, from a range of uh, academic backgrounds uh, coming in uh, with very different uh, A-levels and expectations of doing economics in the rest of their degree. For some of them, this will be the only economics course they take in their entire degree if they decide to pivot away from that uh, on the BA in political economy or PPE. Um, my lectures uh, were 260 people signed up to the course. They were, unfortunately, at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, and so I can't say that that many people always turned up, given they're also recorded. Uh, but for the purposes of this, the important thing here is they were big lectures and they're in a big auditorium. So our module comprises of 22-hour lectures, uh, and we choose to cover here the 16 kind of cumulative uh, core core units, if you like, uh, and then four of the six capstone units. Uh, that's supplemented with 20 uh, one-hour seminars, uh, and we structure these around uh, multiple choice questions, of which core provides uh, a big bank. Um, also part of the exam is structured around that, so students uh, uh, wanted this as part of the seminars. 
Uh, and then also we do some of the longer exercises from the ebook, aiming to get a bit of discussion going uh, in the classroom and make it a bit more interactive. Uh, so my role in this was actually le lecture in the second semester, uh, which went from uh, unit 11 to 16 and then four of the capstone units. Uh, so I've covered quite a lot of the units that are focused uh, on the aggregate economy, uh, specifically units 13 to 16, which heavily use uh, the labour market model. So I think uh, both myself and the lecturer in the first term, the kind of uh, core of what we were doing here uh, was built around the uh, lecture notes that were provided by the core project, uh, an excellent resource that you can find in the resources section of the website uh, if you sign up as an instructor. Um, but equally then, I was trying to build on uh, what was already there um, to add some additional elements into the lecture. Uh, these are not going to be as uh, technologically advanced as some of the things we heard about in the flipped classroom session yesterday, um, but I think they've been successful uh, and they've worked well uh, in my big lectures. And crucially, probably for people thinking of doing them, uh, they have lower entry costs than some of the things we talked about yesterday. They're very easy to do. So the first thing I did was, uh, at the start of each lecture, I tried to motivate what I was going to be teaching in that unit uh, with a recent uh, relevant real-world example. Uh, and I think students like this because they can then see that what they're learning in core is helping them better understand the world around them. And even though, of course, core uh, builds in a lot of uh, empirical motivation for what you're learning, and that's part of the new way the textbook is structured, students still very much like it when uh, Things they're learning can be applied to say things they see in the news, uh, developments in politics and economics. Uh, next, and this is sort of tied into the first one, I try to provide uh, through our virtual learning environment uh, additional kind of newspaper and magazine articles that relate to uh, some of the examples I'm using uh, and the material that we're learning in the unit. Uh, and then also some journal articles uh, where that's appropriate and some of the students that feel that... Uh, they're a little bit ahead of the material, and this is hard uh, or, or happens more often when you've got such a diverse range of students. They like to have some journal articles that complement what they're learning in the class so they can uh, get ahead uh, of the curve. And lastly, and I think this is probably the most interesting thing I experimented with this year in the lectures, uh, and probably what the focus of the rest of this talk is going to be about, uh, is about bringing uh, some discussion-based exercises into my uh, big lectures. Uh, and this is um, something that I think helps students to uh, reflect a bit on what they're learning uh, and then to try and apply that to new cases uh, and really to demonstrate some of the competencies we're hoping they're going to gain uh, from learning this uh, core material. Uh, also, on a more practical level, uh, these are two-hour lectures. Uh, it breaks up the lectures a little bit. It helps with students' participation. And one thing I've learnt... Uh, the hard lessons that, however, sort of inspiring and life-changing my lecturing may be, uh, it may be hard to listen to that uh, sitting there passively for two hours. So what I'm going to do now, and hopefully this will wake everyone up uh, slightly, is to provide uh, a sort of interactive example from uh, Unit 13, uh, which is on economic fluctuations and unemployment. And for the next five minutes or so, you're going to be uh, my set of King's College London undergraduate students. So today we're going to be looking at Unit 13. Uh, and what's really at the heart of Unit 13 is uh, this idea of consumption smoothing households uh, and uh, how uh, this behavior can help stabilize uh, shocks uh, in the aggregate economy. And this sort of harks back to what we, we were doing in Unit 10, uh, which was where we saw that because of this dimin diminishing marginal utility of consumption, uh, that households prefer to consume similar amounts of goods and services in different periods, and they're basing their kind of lifetime consumption plans on their expectations of the future, and specifically their expectations of what's going to happen to their income in the future. And so in line with that, and part of the motivation for today's lecture, uh, is going to be uh, the youth debt crisis in the UK. And specifically this kind of pronounced uh, build-up of debt between, uh, of young people uh, in the economy. And we're going to see how this very much ties in uh, to some of the themes in this unit. And we can see the importance, really, of this issue, given that the head of the Financial Conduct Authority, the UK's financial regulator, is clearly putting this high up uh, on their agenda 
uh, uh, at present. So we're going to do uh, a little quick uh, classroom discussion exercise. So I want you to talk to your neighbour uh, for five minutes or so and think about the following two cases. Uh, and this is going to link into the set of slides we've just been through, uh, which is to do with uh, economic fluctuations and consumption. So uh, firstly, we've got one case. Uh, we've got an unemployed or insecurely employed person uh, who uses short-term credit. We can think of payday loans here, uh, high-interest uh, short-term loans, uh, to cover their basic living expenses. The second person, and this may seem familiar to you, is an undergraduate student at King's College London, uh, and they're accumulating debt uh, for their fees, for their accommodation, and for their living expenses. Okay, and so we want to think a bit about our own situation and the extent to which uh, we're consumption smoothing. So in each case with your uh, neighbour, just quickly discuss, uh, so is this an example of consumption smoothing in each of the cases? Uh, and is this behaviour likely to stabilise the aggregate economy or not? Okay, so if you start those conversations, I'll come around and speak to a couple of groups uh, and then we can get uh, some feedback afterwards. So please, talk amongst yourselves. So if we had a bit more time here today, one thing you can do in this type of scenario is to directly get some feedback from the audience. Uh, given we've um, got a short space of time today, I'll talk through what are the main things I want the students to pull out of that exercise and also some of the things I got from going around and speaking uh, to the groups. So I think the key thing here being uh, that consumption smoothing is, is all about your expectations of future income. Uh, and you could reasonably conceive that the expectations of future income for these two groups would be very different. Um, so if we have um, an undergraduate student at King's College London like yourselves, uh, you'll be expecting, uh, I would hope, given that you're here and the amount of fees you're paying, uh, that you'd likely earn a lot, uh, a sort of graduate premium, if you like, over your lifetime uh, from having got a degree from King's College London. And the latest biz data on that is suggesting that uh, for men, it's around £168,000 you would earn extra over your lifetime from having a university degree. And for women, it's higher, around £250,000, uh, although uh, their baseline is lower if they don't have a university degree. Uh, and so there's a big premium there, reasonable expectation on your part that income could go up in the future. And so this could be a good example of consumption smoothing behaviour. Uh, though one thing that was brought out from one of the discussions uh, that I had uh, which is interesting is that even students with this reasonable expectation of increased future income uh, may still be credit constrained uh, and they may still not be able to borrow uh, as much as they would like. Um, say if they have expectation they're going to be a banker and earn lots of money in the future, it still may be difficult uh, to uh, take on a lot of debt now uh, beyond your university costs. Um, so I think it's clear that in the first case it's less likely uh, although not impossible, that there's a, a clear expectation there that the income of this person is going to go up in the future. If they're using these expensive loans to cover their basic living expenses, it's uh, quite unlikely uh, they're going to get uh, out of that sort of vicious cycle if they're doing that on a repeating basis, particularly given the interest that's likely to build up. When we're thinking about the effect on the aggregate economy and whether this behaviour is stabilising or not, uh, I think the FCA article that I put on the virtual learning environment uh, makes it very clear that this, particularly in the first case, this type of behaviour is thought to increase financial fragility uh, and make it more likely the economy is going to respond negatively uh, when adverse shocks uh, hit households. Um, and I think there, there are many different things uh, you could continue to say on this, um, but... It may also adversely affect consumption, which has effects on growth in the economy, if people are using a large amount of their income uh, to pay interest uh, on these type of short-term loans. So I think there's a lot you could do with this type of exercise, uh, but I'll leave it now uh, and move on. So to take myself out of the Teaching the King students and back into the room uh, with some core uh, teachers, uh, so I sort of had success with uh, that exercise. That was one of the first ones I tried in response to some feedback from the students that 
uh, the lectures were just keeping too close to the core material. Uh, and from then on, I tried to introduce a couple of these uh, exercises into each of my lectures for the rest of the semester. And just to uh, give some examples from Unit 14 and 15, which clearly cover the aggregate economy that we've been talking about in this session. Um, in uh, Unit 14, where we're looking at unemployment and fiscal policy, I did a couple of different exercises. Uh, so I think Atif and Mian's work on uh, consumption uh, and uh, sorry, household wealth and consumption during the financial crisis is something students find really interesting. Um, and I provided some of the interesting figures from their work uh, that were just taken from their website uh, and asked them to relate it uh, to the models and concepts they'd learned in Unit 14. Uh, later on in the lecture, once we covered the material on um, fiscal policy, uh, I showed this uh, short uh, YouTube video that Mark Blythe made on austerity uh, which is sort of him and, and the Brown department have done lots of animations around him while he's talking, which is uh, always uh, enjoyable for the students. Uh, and then I got them to relate that to material they're learning, the fallacy of composition, uh, and uh, the, the effects of implementing fiscal consolidation in a, in a downturn, and also to pose some critiques of what he was saying, uh, which is in some ways quite politically charged, thinking about the effects on inequality. Uh, when we come on to Unit 15, which is... Uh, on inflation, unemployment, and monetary policy. Um, Wendy earlier showed those three graphs which showed the price setting and wage setting curves moving around, the bargaining gap that opens up, and the effect that you would have on inflation. So I also showed that slide and taught the students through those. Uh, and then I provide them with some other factors that could shift those curves or change the position of the economy in the cycle and ask them whether they would cause inflation or not. Uh, get them to talk amongst themselves, and then we do a show of hands. Uh, and from what I could gather, the understanding in the room was pretty good, although you could wait until everyone else would put their hand up and then just uh, join them. Uh, so there, there are some drawbacks of that method. Um, and lastly, then, uh, negative interest rates are something that's been in the news uh, a lot recently, with some central banks taking those positions. Uh, and students uh, find that interesting. It's not covered in great detail in the core book. Uh, so I did a, a discussion exercise about that, motivated at the start of the lecture, uh, and then showed this FT Markets video on why uh, investors might want to buy negative yielding bonds, which I think elicited some interesting discussion with the students. So I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'll just uh, sum up uh, briefly now. So I think these lecture exercises uh, that I've given you an example of today are a good way of encouraging sort of active over passive learning, uh, and uh, flipping the classroom in the terminology that we had yesterday. Uh, I was somewhat apprehensive, given this was my first year lecturing, and there are a lot of students to try this type of thing in the lecture, uh, but I think it worked very well. Uh, students were, were pretty positive about it. After the first exercise, I got a show of hands as to uh, the students that would like this type of thing in the lectures in future, and every single person in the room put their hand up. Um, and so formal and informal feedback on these exercises have been very positive. Um, this is only my first year, and, and this is uh, only the first step of the things I'd like to introduce into my lectures. Uh, and as we discussed yesterday, I think this is going to involve, to some extent, uh, teaching less content in the lectures, because even in a two-hour lecture, getting for a unit of core material is actually very difficult. Um, uh, and that's one of the challenges I found with bringing these things into the lecture, is trying to fit everything in together. Um, but interactive multiple choice questions uh, and perhaps some kind of macroeconomic simulator uh, would be something I'd like to introduce into these units uh, from next year. And there's a macroeconomic simulator in the textbook, um, uh, Wendy's uh, intermediate textbook that she talked about earlier. So one thing I think uh, hopefully this uh, talk and this session can facilitate is, is just sharing ideas with other instructors in the core community that are going to be lecturing uh, uh, this material and trying out different things. And I think the launch of Core Labs uh, over the, the course of this workshop is going to be very useful for sharing ideas and also directly sharing material. So I'll be putting a lot of my lecture material on there uh, for anyone to use, and I hope a lot of other people uh, will do the same. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much.
Okay, so uh, hello everyone. For those of you that I haven't spoken to yesterday, I'm Gonzalo Paspardo. I'm a PhD student at UCL, and I'm here because I'm, I've been teaching core for the, I've been a teaching assistant for core for the past three years. So that has been I've been with core since the beta version, even since before we had the, the final version of the ebook. And I've also been, apart from teaching students for all of this time, I've also been very involved in training new TAs that access this material for the first time. And um, I'm a bit like familiar with all of the struggles that both students and, and, and TAs uh, have had with the, with the material. And I want to focus a bit on, Wendy has already given us like the, the central ideas, but I want to focus a bit on the labor market model, what's new and weird for someone that arrives for the first time at core, what's most challenging for students, what's most challenging for teachers. And for those of you who haven't taught it yet, maybe uh, I will be successful in giving you like a couple of the central ideas of the model so that you, you can have them clear in your mind. So uh, as Wendy was commenting about it earlier, this labor market model is an efficiency wage model. So it's based under the idea that in order for an employee to exert effort and to work well, we need to pay them sufficiently. So uh, the employer is always having in their mind the fact that in order to make the worker exert optimal effort, we need to pay them just as much. Uh, for teachers, this is usually a the most different part of the core material like some other parts, game theory, etc., are probably more standard, let's say. But for teachers, this is very different from a standard labor supply, labor demand type of model that many of us might, might uh, have in mind. But from my experience, for students, and particularly for students who haven't studied economics before, uh, it is challenging because it's a model with several moving parts and the determination of equilibrium, there are many moving parts. But it's usually interesting and it agrees a lot with their intuition about how the, how the economy works and their personal experience and probably even more than what a labor supply, labor demand model does, at least in my experience when I studied it, I felt very dissatisfied with the, the way the labor supply, labor demand model uh, uh, was working. So my advice when you're training a new TA or we're trying to bring new people into, into this model, into this part of the model, is to try and leave the old models aside for a second, focus on the material and read it as a student, as someone that's arriving to economics. And then at the very end, again, it's natural to try to be critical and compare with the, with the models we're most familiar to. But at the beginning, I would, I would begin like that. And let me focus a bit on these major challenges that I, was, that I was commenting at the very beginning. So the first challenge, when you already talked a bit about this, is that uh, the model, the labor market model, is based on this labor discipline idea. So uh, if my worker really, really values the job he's in because he's very scared of losing it because there's high unemployment or because he knows he's been working with me for 30 years and he will never find another decent job again, then I don't need to pay him that much, a lot to keep him motivated to keep him in the job. When my worker has a lot of outside options and could just cross the door and go to work to a different bank, then I need to pay, them, pay him or her more to, to motivate him. So this idea that your outside options are affecting your decisions, even if you don't take them, might be very obvious for people who, for most of us who are economists and have been working with it for a long time. But it is very new for students. Students struggle to think, well, if you don't quit your job, then why are your, what's happening elsewhere affecting you? So this is something that's that's a, a crucial to make clear. Then the second point is, well, following this argument, that's how we build this one of the central elements of the model, which is this, this wage setting curve. The idea is when unemployment is higher in the economy, your outside options are lower, so I can pay you less and you will still exert optimal effort. So via this, we establish a lot of equilibrium points depending on how a, how unemployment is, this is how much companies need to pay workers. So the fact that we are establishing an equilibrium in one model and that the wage setting curve is the set of equilibrium points from that model is again something that's challenging for students, but that I believe is also useful when they're studying any other, any other subject. Many people were worried about how all of this material translates into their further studies in economics. Well, knowing how establishing a an equilibrium in a given model translates into 
a different equilibrium is a skill that if they get it clearly, it can easily be translated to many other, many like to when they study more micro, even if they study a more traditional, let's say, type of macro uh, later on. So on the one side of the model, we have this wage setting curve that's reflecting these incentives of workers. On the other side, we have the price setting curve. And by talking to people who, who have uh, taught core to students, they always tell me that this is one of the things that they really struggle the most about. Some people were like, telling me they had to resort to the equations and go through the equations to try to justify it. Uh, even if we don't go to go down deep into the equations because we don't have time or maybe not everyone has like a one year course like we do in UCL, the basic idea that we can convey to the students in, in half a second is the price setting curve as a way of splitting the pie of the total production of the economy. So there is a level of average product of labor, there's everything we produce basically that we need to split it between employees and, and companies. And we can think of the price setting curve as how we regulate this split. So if there is a lot of competition between firms, and you can rationalize it with students telling them, well, uh, firms are both competing to sell products at the lower cost, but you can even rationalize it indirectly as they're also competing for workers. With a lot of competition in the economy, firms will be getting a lower proportion and workers will be getting more. The opposite happens if, if competition is scarce. If there are only a couple of companies, they will have more power and they will get a larger share of the pie. And that, for me, that would be like the central intuitive idea to, to, to get them there. So just with this couple of ideas, we can build in their minds the idea of what is this equilibrium in the labor market that's so crucial from the way we, we, we explain things in, in core. And another thing that's very that we can translate very clearly to, um, to any other of the micro, macro, etc. that they do later is the notion of equilibrium. So in the traditional model with labor supply, labor demand, we just see the equilibrium very clearly, but it's a bit, sometimes it's even hard to understand as a notion why is that an equilibrium, what happens if we are of equilibrium. This model is more full of intuitive content, so it's a bit more open to discussion what happens if we are somewhere off equilibrium? Uh, what does it mean to be on equilibrium? And focusing a lot on this concept with students is, again, useful for this, useful for, for other economics they, they learn. Yeah. So these are just like what I believe the like four major challenges in explaining the central idea of the labor market. And then uh, this, as, as it was being explained before, it's a crucial element for, for the more macro part of core for the second half of the course. And actually, if someone is going to use the core material just to teach a course in macro, I would recommend to begin with like a one, even one session on the labor market drawing material from unit six, seven, nine, to, to get the, market, the labor market clear and then go into the, into the macro thing. Uh, and what we are going to, we're using this model for in the material is well, for several reasons, but basically it's going to serve as the supply side of the economy, uh, which will be the counterpart to these aggregate demand shocks. And we're going to find that it's useful to study inflation. It provides a very intuitive way of thinking about inflation. But this is, has proven particularly challenging, and most of all for teachers. So uh, fellow teaching assistants have struggled a lot the first time to see how we can study inflation uh, in this way. Instead students find the story more compelling than some other stories they may have, uh, we might have studied, like menu costs, uh, Calvo Ferry, Rottenberg adjustment costs, anything that sounds a bit like, how can we ever find that in the data? This looks more appealing, particularly to, to students of the first year. And it's going to be very useful to, to interpret uh, economic history. So let me give you a couple of ideas about this thing of inflation, because it's usually one of the things that people get the more uh, get the most put off about. So we, the way we explain inflation in the core material is as the result of being off equilibrium in the labor market. So there is this equilibrium in the labor market that's the intersection between what's the level of competition in the economy and how much do we need to pay workers to motivate them to work optimally. If we are at that level of wage, that level of employment, that's what we uh, define as the, as the equilibrium in the labor market and the equilibrium in the, in the aggregate economy. And 
the way we rationalize it is, well, if for some reason there are shocks to aggregate demand, like there is an increase given that equilibrium, there is like an increase in like future expectations about the earnings or business confidence or etc., we will be producing a bit more than, than there will, that we would be in the equilibrium. So unemployment will be a bit lower than it is in equilibrium. So in that moment, workers, again, going back to this efficiency wage model, that's why it's very important always to go back to this labor discipline model and how we are motivating workers. Now unemployment is lower, so we need to pay workers more to motivate them to, to, to work. Then there is this story in the book about like a marketing department and uh, like how decisions are being made in the firm, but the idea is, well, no unemployment is lower, we need to pay them more. Then the company indeed ra raises their wages, but then the marketing department of the firm that's setting the prices says, well, Given these rising wages, we also need to raise prices because given the level of competition in the economy, if we don't do that, we are not going to be making profits. So this is basically this central intuitive idea. That's what m teachers struggle, like new teaching assistants to this material struggle a lot, is the way we think of inflation in, in this context. That's what we call the bargaining gap, this difference between what we need to pay both workers to motivate them and... and, and the, the wage that would be consistent with the, with the profit maximization of the firms and the, and the competition in the economy. And something that this is what teachers find more, most challenging and what students instead find most challenging is the, how to aggregate. So how can we link a story of a representative firm to the story of the aggregate economy? They're saying, well, but I'm not, I don't buy things from the same company that I work for. So this idea of there is a representative firm that ends up we are using as a, as a way of modeling the aggregate economy is something that's worth spending a bit of time on and basically telling something like, well, all firms, a similar process is happening in all of the firms and that's what leads to the aggregate thing. And I see this as a success, of course, because we are priming them so much to think about heterogeneity and we prime that a lot to think that firms are different, workers are different, etc that they really think about this, uh, this, this aggregation much more seriously than they would in, like in, a, in a standard macro model. There are just for, I'm leaving in the slides just for future reference, that to study this carefully, uh, one exercise that I find very useful is comparing an aggregate demand shock with an oil shock, that's, that's in the material. But what's most important uh, about this model is that it can help us provide, as Wendy was saying, a way of rationalizing parts of economic history. So basically, this model provides us a way to rationalize what's going on, for example, in the stagflation period. So instead of telling them, well, stagflation happened and no one understood it, which we do when we explain that that's what's going on, we also tell them that there are some models we, using the models and the tools we have developed, we can provide a rationale to why there is a positive bargaining gap, so why there is, we are generating inflation at the same time that uh, unemployment is increasing. So we can really use these models to try to, to, to uh, explain to them historical periods and that's what Unit 17 is, is mostly about. And something that sometimes you will find, again, much more frequently with new TAs and new teachers, but also with students, is people telling you, well, why do we go via all of this complication instead of just using this uh, labor supply, labor demand, or aggregate demand, aggregate supply? A model that I have learned in the past. 90% of the time you will find that this is just because people are resistant to change from a model that they have already learned because they made an investment on it. 10% of the time they will have a good argument in favor of the old models and that's fine and that's something we are happy to encourage. This slide I stole from one of Wendy's slides but I'm just leaving it here for your future reference. In case someone's asking why are we modeling it this way, this is just a couple of of points that explain a bit why we do things the way we do, and that might be helpful when, when with students or with, with uh, teachers. You will have these slides, so, so that stays there. So just to summarize, because I believe we're running a bit out of time already, uh, the model, this model of the labor market that looks ex ante very difficult is just based on a couple of key ideas. Uh, we find, or I have found in, over these years, that it connects more clearly to, with students' intuition that you would expect in the very beginning. That it is, you, sometimes it's with teachers and like TAs and people who will be running the tutorial sessions that need to 
prepare a bit more to do something different. And collaboration is key. So in UCL, we run weekly meetings to discuss the model and what we're going to explain the next week. This is something that if you have the resources to do, I, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, the fact that things are more related to students' intuition than, uh, than the labor supply, labor demand model makes classes more participative and more open than, 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 you, would, than you would expect at the beginning. And finally, in a positive note, students find it interesting and students understand it faster than we think or at least it is not differentially more challenging than a standard model would be for them because in the end the most things that they find most difficult like opportunity costs, aggregation, equilibrium, etc. are just central features of economics that we are teaching anyway. So, uh, so that's the key challenge and it's not that we are adding a much bigger additional challenge for them. And that's it, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Leave it to the chair. No, I'm just saying, um, <laughs> I think we're running a little bit uh, out of time. Uh, maybe one question or two, if anybody has got any burning questions, otherwise we can go for it. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the model accommodates them very well because with this idea of, well, how much do you need to pay workers to make them exert effort, yeah. unions change this. Right. So having a union might make them pay, make the companies pay even more than you need uh, to exert optimal effort because they get together and you need to pay them that, otherwise they, they yes. would. And we also reflect a bit on whether unions are inclusive or, um, or not and how to some extent sometimes just being in a union and uh, having a voice in, in, in setting your wages come, might, end it, might end up having po even positive effects in general. So all of this is in the material. Yeah, and just to note on that as well, that we, we really uh, take seriously the heterogeneity of countries. So we, we have a model that, is, uh, that can deal with a country where unions play no role. We can have a situation where unions set the wage and we can have a model of inclusive unions where there's a voice effect and where we'd expect very different outcomes. And we show the data. So just as with unemployment benefits in the data, there's no clear cross-sectional relationship between unemployment and uh, and uh, benefits, similarly, similarly in the union case uh, with coverage and unemployment. And that can be a big mystery to students. So, so the model is very, is very helpful to, uh, to allow that, um, uh, which, you know, if you're teaching in the Netherlands, you know, we have a nice comparison between the UK and the Netherlands, uh, for example, of how institutions can change over time and the effects on unemployment and they're, they're two very contrasting cases. So unions become more inclusive in one case, unions become weaker in the other case and in both cases you can construct an argument about why you might predict unemployment would fall. <laughs>